see the group chat up or um, uh, whatever feels comfortable. So sure. hi, I'm Edwin Rutsch, director of the Center for Building a Culture of Empathy, and today I'm here with Robert Elliott. Uh, thanks, Robert, uh, for joining me for this discussion. It's a pleasure. I love talking about empathy. <laughs> what I do with my life, right? So, uh, yeah, and I'm glad that you're doing this. Uh, as I said, you're uh, catching me at the end of a long week of very intense training, and uh, um, you know, so. Um, I'm kind of a little tired, maybe from. Well, a little tired, but also just full of the richness of it too. So, mm -hmm. yeah. We're talking about a favorite topic for both of us. So. Right. Right. Okay. Let me introduce you a little bit here. So, you're a professor. I have some notes here that I took. So, you're a professor of counseling at the University of Strathclyde, yep. and that's in uh, the UK, yep. or I guess in um, Scotland. Yeah, it's the part of the UK. We're a little bit independent in Scotland, right? You know, so right, yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. And you're uh, you uh, direct the research clinic that teaches counseling research and emotion focused therapy, and oh. you've been working in the person centered approach in that field for you know, quite some time. I'm not sure how many years, but uh, and you've done you've been an author of several books, 140 journal articles and book chapters. Yeah. And I saw a, a paper that you uh, co-authored uh, just entitled Empathy. And it starts off by saying, after defining empathy, discussing its measurements and offering an example of empathy in practice, we present the results of an updated meta-analysis of the relation between empathy and uh, psychotherapy outcomes. You've been writing about empathy and uh, you've also been teaching some workshops I saw. Uh, mm -hmm. and. I understand creating a curriculum around empathy and, and the workshops that I saw that you were doing was one in Paris called Advanced Empathy Training for Emotion Focused Therapy yep. and then Singapore even a class on Empathy Masterclass. Yep, so, yep. So I just wanted to, you know, just chat, dialogue with you, hear about your experiences with empathy, I guess in the person-centered approach. And I'd seen a, an interview which I just really loved even before I, you know, got connected with you where you talked about the tribes of the person-centered approach, and it really helped create a perspective, you yeah. know, kind of putting everything in perspective. And yeah. I'm even wondering, like, how do you see empathy in that w between the different tribes as well, yeah. you know, the person-centered approach? Right, right. Of course, empathy is central to all the different tribes. Uh, it's the thing we most strongly agree on being important. Um, so it kind of unites, it unites the tribes, right? But it looks a little bit different in the different you know, depending on whether you're a more classical person-centered therapist or a, a focuser or emotion-focused therapist. And um, my recent recurrence of interest in, uh, in empathy has come from the realization that in order to become a competent, skilled uh, emotion-focused therapy a practitioner, um, you need extremely strong empathy skills. Mm. I think emotion-focused therapy makes more demands on empathy than you know, other, other tribes do in the person-centered approach, you know, so then, then say classical person-centered therapy. So when you're working with these intense emotion processes, uh, then you have to be, you know, it's like you, you need to rely on empathy even more strongly than, mm. than otherwise. And so that's fueled a number of us in the emotion-focused therapy approach to, uh, like uh, Gene Watson and I in particular, um, but also Alberta Poss, to develop uh, start developing these curricula for empathy training, and it's particularly for countries where there's not a strong base of empathy training like there is in the UK with the person-centered approach, you know, so, you know, we do a two-year course um, that's person-centered therapy um, that's mostly learning empathy. Mm -hmm. um, and so people come out of that and um, um, they have a few, a few rules in their head they have to unlearn to, to do emotion-focused therapy, um, uh, sort of ideas about not asking questions and things like that. So they have a few rules to unlearn, but mostly they got a really good start on the empathy part of it, which is so central. But then we go to Paris, uh, where it's uh, dominated by cognitive behavioral therapy or psychoanalytic therapy or Singapore, um, where there's not a tradition of empathy training and people can't learn emotion-focused therapy. Mm, mm -hmm. You know, they can set the chairs up, but then uh, they can't help the clients deepen their emotional processes, and then the change doesn't doesn't happen. 
Um, and you know, some in the Singapore training we did in, um, uh, I think it was February this year, uh, people got the end of the three day intensive, you know, masterclass in empathy and they're saying, so this is where the magic is. It's in the empathy, it's in the quality of the empathy. And then you know, the stuff we do with chairs and focusing and other things like that, that all gets driven by the empathy pro process. So I'm really excited, I'm gonna roll out, I'm actually gonna bring the coal back to Newcastle or uh, tea back to India or something, you know. So I'm gonna roll out that, that training that I've been doing in Paris and Singapore here in Scotland, because I think we can actually help our person-centered practitioners here, here go even further with empathy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So in your, your, what I'm kind of hearing there is in the, in these other countries uh, in in uh, Singapore and in uh, right. Paris or in, in France and right. that they they just don't have a tradition of of working with empathy or kind of practicing empathy. So you're kind of having to go to really back to kind of square one to teach people. Exactly. So you're, I guess you're getting very nuanced in how do we start teaching people empathy who just haven't had any training at all. So you kind of course, people come in at all different levels, right? And mm -hmm. so you have to, you know, even the training here in Scotland, we have to kind of differentiate what we do for people coming at different levels. But yeah, when there's not that tradition, then it's a different, and we have to call it advanced empathy because people won't come along. They think they know what empathy is. I mean, mm -hmm. you probably went into this all the time. Of course we know what empathy is. You know, everybody knows what empathy is. It's it's tea and sympathy or something like that. I mean, you know, so and I don't need it. The other guy needs it. <laughs> yeah, 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 right, exactly. I already know how to do this, right? It's easy, right? Yes. So we've got that to deal with. Anyway, yeah, so let me tell you about my journey a little bit, if that's okay. Okay, great. Yeah, your journey around empathy or in general? Yeah, my journey, well, yeah, around empathy and... Okay, great. Uh -huh. I'd love to hear that. Yeah. You know, so my, my um, major professor in graduate school was a, was a student of Carl Rogers. His name is Jerry Goodman, um, and um, so that was in the 1970s. Uh, so my first training as a therapist was in person-centered therapy. I then went and got training in uh, family therapy and psychodynamic therapy and even cognitive therapy before there was such a thing as cognitive therapy. And for a lot of years, I was kind of an eclectic practitioner. But in 1985, I kind of focused my practice back to my sort of sources or roots. I began working with Les Greenberg and Laura Rice. And Laura Rice was another student of Carl Rogers. Um, and um, who developed uh, something called evocative empathy. And Les Greenberg was a student of Carl, of, I'm sorry, of Laura Rice's, mm -hmm. uh, was studying Gestalt therapy. So the three of us developed what's today known as emotion-focused therapy. And that we did that sort of through the latter half of the 1980s, um, developing this model. Um, but it was always based on person-centered uh, facilitative conditions, and in particular, empathy. Um, and when we started out developing the therapy, we began by analyzing our practice. Um, what were the, we asked ourselves, what guides, what are the principles that guide our practice as therapists as we work? And we realized the very first principle was what we called empathic attunement. So it's always, you know, as the client enters the session, what are they experiencing as they come in into an encounter with us? So it's always becoming attuned to the client and that's where we, that's the starting point. And then in each moment as the session evolves, something in, in the client's experiencing is shifting constantly. And so then we're tracking that. We always go, we start with empathic attunement, we go back to empathic attunement. Um, and, um, and then of course we offer our understanding to the client um, and then we begin to you know, do all the things in EFT, emotion focused therapy that involve different kinds of tasks or work in the session. Um, but it's all based on a foundation of empathy. Now, in our writings, the books that we've written, um, Facilitating Emotional Change, 1993, Learning Emotion Focused Therapy, 2004, in these books, um, we emphasize the tasks more than the empathy. Mm -hmm. Because we'd always just basically assumed that the people who were reading the books and learning the therapy would have this background, uh, this sort of strong training in empathy. But as it's turned out, that's not the case. And so now the big thing in emotion-focused therapy is to develop better, clearer statements about 
uh, our understandings of empathy and how you learn empathy and what it looks like. Um, so we basically come back around to this. Mm -hmm. So you're really working now on kind of articulating and developing programs on how do you teach people empathy and even going back to square one where people just have no background so you can guide them yeah. into that. So, so you have a, how many people are working on this? Is there like the emotion focused therapy? Is this something within that uh, school of therapy that's now the whole community is kind of working on this or is this a group or? Well, certainly a group of us. Mm -hmm. you know, the emotion focused therapy community is, is fairly diverse at this point, but there's a group of us who are, there's a lot of interest in a group of us. Well, maybe, would it be like 10 or 15 of us probably in a group of about 200 active EFT practitioners around the world, something like that. Um, and, you know, so there's a group of us who are interested in, in, in going further with the empathy work and the empathy training because um, it's so foundational. Um, we had a conference last October in the Netherlands and we did some brainstorming or what's it called, thought showering around, um, um, you know, different kinds of empathy training, you know, wow. techniques and things like that. Um, so that's, a, we'll be developing that further as we go, right? And, um, mm -hmm. But that's kind of where we're at the moment. Now, I mean, here in Scotland, um, we offer training at three different levels. Uh, so we've got basically pre-professional training. So we've got people coming along for something that's called a, you know, a, a certificate in counseling skills. And these are just, you know, people off the street, basically. Um, so they have no experience as counselors. And so there it's like, um, helping people unlearn all their bad habits as psychological helpers, you know, like asking questions, um, giving advice, making sympathy. empathy, mm -hmm. sympathy, reassurance. All the blocks. Kind of, it sounds like you go through all the blocks of empathy yeah. and undo those blocks. Or these are all the bad habits that get in mm -hmm. the way of people really listening and being empathic. So, so they get, they get at the, at the certificate level, the counseling skills level, they got, they get basically told, don't ask questions, right? And um, um, that kind of paralyzes them a bit. And they develop a, what we call the person-centered police. Uh-huh. Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. Person-centered police is like, it wouldn't be Carl Rogers. wouldn't actually be Carl Rogers because he wasn't like that. But it's your image of Carl Rogers that sits on your shoulder and says, you know, don't ask questions. You know, don't, you know, don't do this. Don't, do, don't be directive. Right, so they get this terrible person-centered police. Mm -hmm. um, it's to, it's to basically kick them, it's like kicking yourself with a bad habit of asking questions as your go-to response. And um, I mean, you know, I think about my, my, my advisor, Jerry Goodman, in the 1970s, that was what he was about, was like helping people broaden their repertoire of helping skills, right? And, and making room for empathy, making room for empathic reflection responses. Um, so, well, maybe I can share some. Oh, go ahead. Well, like, there was something. So for, I'm not coming from the therapeutic yeah, you know, yeah. realm. That's not my background. And I came more kind of from a seeker, you know, a quest seeker of life, you know, finding meaning in life. And I came across empathy. And I thought, wow, this is really the gateway to connection and deeper connection. That's kind of what I'm seeking is kind of, you know, yeah, yeah. meaning and deeper connection. And uh -huh. then Barack Obama. Uh, you know, talked about empathy as well. And I thought, oh, there's going to be this cultural revolution creating more social empathy. Yeah, you know? yeah. And I thought, well, I'll start working on that, you know, kind of supporting that. And so I've really been looking at how do we, um, you know, bring empathy just into daily life, you know, sort of yeah. mutual empathic social empathy in the family, in the workplace, you know, out in the community. And there is, you know, the, the therapeutic world, which, you know, Carl Rogers was in, it's, mm -hmm. it's part of the, the empathy seems to be kind of in this, uh, in this client therapist uh, relationship, right? It's like, I'm the therapist, you're the client. So I'm going to listen to you and, you know, be very empathic and hear you kind of, and that's going to help you work through your problems and you're going to go on your merry way and be, you know, more functional in society, where for me, it seems like it's really about, it's only, and that's almost like just teaching one side of empathy. It's yeah, not, right. it's not teaching that the, the person that's coming to you is not learning how to be more empathic. And mm -hmm. so I've kind of seen that the therapy, the empathy has been kind of like 
caught in this therapeutic uh -huh. world uh -huh. instead of kind of going out into so 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 society yes. and uh -huh. seeing how do we really create more empathy between all sides. So I mean, so, uh, you know, someone can come be heard for an hour, they could just be more narcissistic. So they're not learning. So it seems to me they, they should actually be empathizing with the therapist or whatever. The therapist, the therapist should be more of an empathy guide saying, well, this is how you foster more empathy in your life. You can practice, I'm gonna support you and creating more empathy in your family and you know, something like that. So I don't know, what is, how does all that resonate? Uh, well, it certainly makes me think of, first of all, it makes me think of Jerry Goodman, um, who you'd probably love to interview because um, um, he, he, you know, is all about, like, you know, the very thing you're talking about, which is, you know, teaching ordinary people to be more effective in, as listeners and talkers, more skilled talk, uh, uh, talkers, particularly in, when, you know, someone's got something that's a problem or just mm -hmm. distressing to them. Um, so he's certainly into that. Um, that was my first connection. Um, I also could think about, um, you know, how, um, you know, we therapists can be, we're all in our little world, I guess, is kind of what could be there. And um, so I'm very, very caught up in the training, you know, the, the training of therapists and the whole process of therapy, which I love. Um, and it can feel a little bit rarefied and um, off in a corner someplace and cut off. Um, so, but it yeah, seems yeah. like all the processes you're developing and all the curriculum yeah. are transferable to the general public, though. It seems, yeah. it seems like the skills, it's kind of like universal. I mean, all this, the, the videos, everything I see of Carl Rogers, you know, about empathy, it's all like very usable for just daily life. Uh, it seems to me. Well, I mean, you have to be careful, though, Edwin. I mean, I think, I mean, when I started learning um, empathic reflection, I went home. This is when, this is in 1973 or something like that. I went home and I started listening to my wife, uh, my partner, and I got like two resp empathic responses out, and she said, Don't you talk to me like that, give me that empathy talk, right? You know, like, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. she was like, quite annoyed with me actually um, and felt a little bit, I don't know, patronized or played with or something like that. And um, that was quite a good challenge for me actually because I got much, much more skillful with how I was doing it. And she doesn't complain anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, I still do it, but I'm much more <laughs> subtle, right? And, um, but you, ha you have to be careful. And people that come to our courses, you know, we go to take them through a whole series of, of health warnings like, you know, like this course in learning to be a prison center counselor is going to change you. It's going to change how you are with other people. And some of the people in your life are not necessarily going to like that. They're not going to like, you know, like the way you are with them and the kind of honesty you will come to expect from them and the way you talk with them, the way you, some of them are going to, some people are going to have a lot of trouble with that. So I do think we have to be careful because it's not part of the culture now. And um, what did we you do ever uh, did you ever break it down? Like I've had that same experience. Where some people just love being heard like that, and there's a spectrum of people, you know. And there's a whole spectrum. Have you ever broken it down? Like wh who and why is kind of open to the empathy, being you know, uh, empathic? You know what I mean? There's. Yeah, 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 yeah. I had actually set up an empathy tent downtown Berkeley, you know, okay, and okay. for two weeks I was like offering free empathy and empathy yeah, yeah. circles. And some people come by and they just, you know, just gravitate to being heard and like uh -huh. that. And others are just really on edge about it. So what is this stuff anyway? Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 Um, I mean, I, I'll tell you a story, you know, my, mm -hmm. my, my, my friends and I in graduate school, uh, Chris Parker and Nancy Pistrang and I, um, you know, we were working with Jerry Goodman, so we thought, you know, the empathic reflection response is the best reflect is the best helping response in the world. So we created a study uh, to, to 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 prove that, which was like recording sessions and playing them back for clients right afterwards and asking them, you know, how understood they felt or how helped they felt by when the therapist said that, and with our very first pilot client we learned that there's nothing as bad as a bad reflection. Mm, mm -hmm. Wooden, mm. you know, like reflecting the obvious, 
uh, to someone who's not up for it, you know. So we got someone who absolutely hated the therapist's not particularly skilled empathy responses. And, you know, so basically, you know, empathy, you know, when empathy is done badly and with in, in the wrong place, I think it really can stink, right? So um, now the person in the study, this, this, our pilot client was someone who had been in therapy and had bad, had had bad person-centered therapy. So he had been listened to by someone who gave him wooden superficial reflections um, that didn't help him move forward and left him feeling insulted. So, you know, like, what do we do with that? Mm -hmm. so some people are going to be allergic to it. And, um, yeah, there's a joke in The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Um, they say, you know, the, the babble fish enabled uh, people to understand each other. And no matter what language they spoke, you just stick the fish in your ear, right? Then you can, it's a universal translator, right? You mm -hmm. know? And... The babble fish, and the, and the joke is, the babble fish has led to more wars than any other uh, technological invention in history. Right? Uh, uh -huh. People uh, really uh, understood uh, each other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They really then can they could they stand that? It's a joke. I don't know. Um, but you know, so um, what? One thing we've I've been doing is uh, what I call empathy circles. So yeah. it's we're saying that we want to deepen our empathy, and we yeah. use. Uh, have small groups of, of like four to five people and then we use empathic listening with each other. So I'll speak to you, you know, you reflect back until I feel heard to my satisfaction. Okay. And then the person who is listening and reflecting back, then they can choose someone to speak to and that person reflects back and we go for like two hours just uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, dialoguing. We just, we just did one, uh, a couple of days ago on the question of what is an empathic way of being you know Paul Rogers had that great paper sure, empathic yeah. and unappreciated way of being so we're just yeah. dialoguing about what is an empathic way of being like and you know we use that process and also I do it in my family uh, for our family has been using that uh, for like mediation um, yeah. So in the family or something. Yeah, yeah it's it's been like great. People, it's really helped a lot. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, do you, have you done kind of work like that with uh, with uh, em something like an empathy circle? Is that one of the, well, we, we like, do large we do large groups with thirty people in them, um, and unstructured large groups, and it's not it's not as structured as you're talking about. So, but um, people do take turns talking, and then several people will respond to one person mm. and of course it will spark off something else and it will go it goes in all kinds of ways um and without you know with this without the structure people cut across each other uh and then you get you know conflicts and ruptures and things like that that then need to be mediated and and and, and heard right and, and, and sort of work through right mm -hmm. you know, so mm -hmm. we do that kind of work that we do a lot of that in our training Oh, okay, is that kind of like the T groups? Is that like a more structured T group? Yeah. Or, uh -huh. It's not structured at all. Oh, it's uh, so unstructured. Okay, really I unstructured, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it doesn't have like a you know, like a, a talking stick or anything like that. Or we don't use those structures. It's much looser than that, because of course you know in therapy we don't do that. We're trying to teach people to be counselors, right? So, mm -hmm. um, whereas as a kind of discipline among like-minded people, which it sounds like what you're doing. It's like, so you've got kind of like, so all of us can be full of things we want to say and, and that can be hard to slow ourselves down and to listen to each other. So that's a really powerful way of- Yeah, it's very, it, is, it is rather structured in that sense. We set the intention, you know, our intention is a foster and empathic way of being. Yeah. We light a candle to hold the space uh -huh, uh -huh. and kind of go through the process, you know, go through it and, um, uh, they, there's a process, I don't know if you've ever heard of uh, Dominic Barter, he's uh, in Brazil and he had developed a process uh, similar to this, but he, he, he developed in, in the slums of Brazil where mm -hmm. he would bring uh, conflicting parties together to yeah. do empathic, using this process, a little, mm -hmm. little bit more structured so 
the idea is that as a facilitator of this mediation, empathic mediation process, first you go empathize, offer empathy to all the participants who might be part of the circle, you know, individually. You bring all the participants together. You know, they use this empathic listening to, you know, tap into where they are now. What was, where are they at the time of the uh, incident, which was a precipitating act that caused some kind of conflict. And then what do we do now? So it kind of, you know, within a couple of hours, yeah, yeah, go through this whole process. Um, so it seems like it's not only the gateway, the empathy is not just a gateway towards the whole therapeutic world. It seems like it's the gateway to the whole mediation world, it seems, is my experience. Yeah, mediation doesn't work without without that kind of listening and, and, and empathy, right? Yeah, and I guess the mediator will do it, and then the, the idea is that the parties then begin to develop empathy for each other, right, over time. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. In terms of like your your talk on the different uh, tribes of the person-centered approach, do you, how do you, you you mentioned that your 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 tribe of the emotion-focused therapy kind of uses the empathy most? How do you see the other tribes? Like, there's the focusing community. You know, I don't hear too much about empathy in the focusing community, but it seems very much about self-empathy yeah. and. Um, there's maybe the more traditional person-centered approach therapy or well or, I, don't want, I don't want people to get the impression that I think that um, somehow empathy is more important in EFT than it is in the other tribes um, and certainly um, it's central in EFT but it's also central in focusing and it's central in uh, more classical person-centered approaches um, I mean, I mean, the different tribes, I think, feature somewhat different kinds of empathy. Um, there's a particular quality of empathy and focusing, which I love, which is like getting, hearing it exactly right, the new, down to the nuance uh, of the experience that's right in the moment. So there's something about that, that very micro, it's almost like a micro empathy you get in mm -hmm. focusing. So it's such an important part of the process. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not going further with, the therapist doesn't go further with it, it's like, helping the client to get it just right, and the therapist communicating that they hear that. You know, so that's really important. And it's in the work of Ann Weiser Cornell, mm -hmm. um, you know, whose work I love, and it's one of the foundation, one of the other foundations of BFT. Um, so yeah, you know, um, um, in, I know people don't like the phrase classical person-centered, but um, sort of the more non-directive approaches uh, can focus more on empathy for the current state of being, the client's current state of being, um, and um, sort of that quality of, 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 of being. Um, EFT empathy is more, uh, I think, emphasizes the person's agency more, so the forward movement of the client. So we're really mm -hmm. interested in what the client brings to the session, their task of the work they're there to do, what they're, how they're trying to move forward. So that's a kind of, that's an important aspect of EFT empathy, which I think we emphasize more than, say, the more traditional person-centered approaches do. Um, that's a difference. So I think, you know, and, and one of the, the distinctive aspects of empathy in EFT is what I call um, uh, either close empathic tracking or deep empathic immersion. So it's being deeply immersed in the client's immediate experience. And it's, it's basically why I don't work in the way you're talking about in the empathy circles with this sort of turn taking like that because mm -hmm. you know, we, um, in order for me to be fully attuned to my client, I actually have to be quite active and I'm quite vocal. So I'm repeating little phrases, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sharing speech with the client in a collaborative way. Um, so I'm actually in the process with the client, in their experience. And that's what, in EFT, that's what we, that's the kind of highest ideal of empathy, is mm -hmm. that we're so deeply in the client's experience with them that, say, in a piece of two chair work or empty chair work we're doing, the client doesn't even know what we said. You know, like we're, um, so we're putting things in, trying to capture things about their experience, maybe suggesting things that we think are, we might hear Im implicitly emerging in their experience. We're putting them in, 
and the client's ignoring anything that doesn't fit and they're using the things that, that do fit and they're, but afterwards they can't even remember who said what. Mm, mm -hmm. or into it, right? It's and, almost like the two merge together with yeah, yeah, like yeah. a real, uh-huh. Yeah, and so for me, and that, I mean, I guess if I, if I were to go back to the 17-year-old boy in 1967 who decided he wanted to be a therapist, um, you know, that would be the magic that I would, you know, be a man. That was something like what I, I mean, I don't know what, I can't remember what I thought was then because I probably didn't know, but, but that feels like what I was always aiming for. Mm -hmm. It's almost like a magical state of, of yeah. shared yeah. consciousness or being exactly. or something right. like yeah. that. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah, so that's really what, for me, as a, as a, as a therapist and an emotion focused therapist, that's what I'm aiming for. Mm -hmm. Now we don't, we don't do that all the time. We can't live there all the time. Um, uh, we can't work there all the time, but, but those are the moments that are really special that we're aiming for with, with Klein and I are really immersed in this process together. Mm -hmm. I can yeah. say I really love that state of being too. It's like, you, you just like merge and it's like the whole space becomes like this shared uh, yeah. Yeah. space and you can almost see, feel the other person where they, what each other, it's, I don't know, it's all kind of merged together and. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Carl Rogers talks about this sort of <laughs> as if, you know, I mean, mm -hmm. the, uh, living in the person's experience, uh, or it's as if you're in the person's experience, but also keeping your boundaries. So the question is, I mean, some people would hear me talking about that and say, where's your boundaries? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I mean, it seems to me after years and years of practice that I have a fairly clear sense of where my boundaries are. Uh, and yet somehow also I feel like I can deeply connect in that kind of way uh, that's safe and you know, in therapeutic, right? Um, yeah, yeah, but I mean, and I guess I hear also in what you're saying, this, I mean, I resonate with this sense of um, the hunger for connection, mm -hmm. right? And I know in my own personal story that my interest in empathy does come out of my desire to connect and know the other person Originally, my father, who was rather kind of private person, but this hunger to kind of bridge the gap and really know the other. That's it. Uh huh. So that's. It's very similar, maybe, because I've sometimes people ask me, well, why are you uh, interested in empathy? And I'll start sharing, you know, it's uh, kind of the, the disconnect in my family. You know, we had the generation gap. Mm -hmm. And I'll start, you know, sharing about that. It's, you know, the empathy has been bringing us together. And I'll just start crying, you know. Right. Just, you know. Okay. Wow. Okay. <laughs> I don't, I've talked about it so much that I, I feel like there's more, you know, I don't know. I don't, I don't feel that falling apart, but it was really, that was really a deep uh, meaning for me was that sense of connection that the empathy has brought uh, kind of from family, you know, creating, creating more connection with the family. So you're, you're, you're tuning into it very clearly, and it sounds like that was a similar situation for you with your your father too. Correct. Yeah. 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 And so, so there's a way, mm -hmm. right? And I guess I'm just listening to your. I mean, so at first it so touched you that it was really brought tears, I guess. And um, and now with time, as you've worked into it, you're it's more familiar and mm -hmm. exactly it still touches you deeply. I gather. I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, if we kept going long enough, it was <laughs> you'd get there, right? Okay. Yeah, okay. I'd probably get there too, you know, and, and yeah. Uh, yeah. you know, for the years of traveling, being a seeker, I think that's not really what I was seeking, and that's what the empathy, just seeing that as the gateway, you know, and yeah. and just seeing how uh, you know people can connect so much more deeply, and it would really help uh, you know solve so many of the world's problems if we could raise the level of empathy. Yeah. Uh, in society in general, is that it became a cultural value. Uh, and, you know, Barack Obama seemed to be advocating for it. Uh, you know, he kind of got shot down quite a bit. Yeah, from, someone who's not been met with a, <laughs> a, a, a terrific lot of empathy in his, 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 uh, his term as president, right? Yeah, I can see how, yeah. You know, how he would miss that too, even, right? Yeah, he, uh, he you know, the, uh, I don't know if you, if you tracked uh, his, it, you know, he talked a lot about empathy. He's mentioned about 70, 80 of his speeches, books, and 
in his book and videos and interviews when he ran for office they said why are you running for office in two minutes or less tell us they said my mother taught me empathy and i think the country has an empathy deficit and i can contribute uh, uh, to that I don't know if you were did you had you seen that or were you um no i hadn't seen that i i basically moved to scotland in 2006 during the um the second bush administration Oh, and, wow. uh -huh. I'm a bit insulated from American politics at this point, and 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 mostly gladly. <laughs> uh huh. Yeah, yeah. But I know yeah. that's important and central, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, you had talked about the different uh, uh, tribes. Do you uh -huh. see NVC as one of the tribes of the person yeah, center approach? Yeah. How do you see it fitting in? I yeah. So it's it's not a tribe of of, of counseling practice, but it's a tribe. It's part of the broader. Uh, movement in the person-centered approach, which includes peacemaking, education, relationships, teaching. I mean, you know, Carl Rogers spent the last 10 or 15 years of his life broadening what he, you know, done as a therapist to many, many different areas of people's lives. And so I see NVC as kind of part of that, you know, broadening process. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so they do it. They do, they talk, it talk the, that community talks a lot about empathy. Um, yeah. Sometimes it's kind of it, the the empathy there. They see empathy as just being the needs guessing, need, feeling and needs guessing, and um, there's can be a little kind of more, more restricted. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. My brother was trained in. One of my brothers was trained in NVC. And, um, right. Yeah. So I could at times feel a bit constricted by some of that practice. Right. Yeah. But still, I think it's important and useful. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so. So okay. in terms of what, with the um, curriculum development, uh, you know, I've done a lot of different projects. I thought when Barack Obama was running for office, that there'd be kind of this empathy movement getting formed. Right. Yeah, yeah. And it really never took off. You know, I think uh, uh, Obama didn't uh, have the mechanisms. He, he talked quite eloquently, but he didn't bring it into the Kind of the nuts and bolts like what you're doing is all the you know just getting down to the nitty-gritty the nuts and bolts so i think that part was missing right uh, mm -hmm. as well as um there was like an attack um he had said he was going to choose a supreme court justice and one of the qualities was going to be empathy i don't know if you heard that part no I didn't. yeah and so this was the first supreme court justice mm -hmm. and then uh, the Republicans just went crazy. They, uh, for two weeks, like Fox News was just ranting and raving about how horrible empathy was. Um, yeah, yeah, because we're going to go, we're going to, we're going to like let criminals go loose on the streets and things and um, be soft on crime and all that stuff. The right? whole thing, yeah. And then there was even uh, Glenn Beck said, empathic fascism is coming our way, you know, and he, and, and the, Sorry, and I had so, a lot of trouble with that concept, right? Sorry, okay, okay. That hurts my brain. Yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> and it was, it was that kind of, but one thing I found is that there was no Democrats or progressives that could counter the uh, the arguments. I see, um, okay, okay. Like on the Justice, on the Justice Committee, yeah, there, there's a huge discussion in the Senate about empathy. You know, Jeff Sessions was railing against empathy, he says, what is empathy? Why, do, you know, Why you know? and then there's actually every district and circuit, you know, court nominee and has mm -hmm. to fill out a form. Uh, it's, it's something like, have are you now or have you ever had empathy for someone right yeah yeah that's basically disqualification right yeah for them it is so yeah, so this must be really discouraging for you to see this happening right yeah the anti-empathy anti movement yeah it was anti-empathy yeah. but there wasn't the uh what i found was there was no the academics didn't like stand up and create arguments because the arguments are like uh like uh you know i have the judge will have empathy against our enemies or, or for the poor and not for the others. Instead of just explaining, we're talking about empathy for everyone. Yes. Right. The, the judge will just have empathy for the perpetrator and not for the victims. Exactly. Yeah. It was never going to be about that. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 So anyway, it was, uh, so I'm kind of like wondering, hey, where were you academics? We needed you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We kind of walked out on you. Right. The Democrats and academics kind of let you down. That must yeah. be disappointing, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 
we're, so we're now, it, in ivory, ivory towers, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so right. now I'm really focusing on the uh, training. So really one, you know, like saying, okay, we really need to be able to train people, get them trained. So I'm hoping we can have some kind of a, uh, maybe some kind of collaboration. So I'm wondering like, how are you going about training? You know, what do you, yeah, because you want yeah. to know nuts and bolts kind of things, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. And okay. I'm looking at doing a, like an online MOOC, you know, a training MOOC that would be publicly yeah. available. So I'm just I wondering, what, how do you see a, a training? What, what does that kind of look like for you? Well, I, I was starting to say a while ago that, you know, it depends upon the level the person's at, you know, in their, um, you know, if we're, if we're, I mean, and I know that you're not, you're, your interests are far broader than training counselors or psychotherapists, mm -hmm. you know, but in training in my field, you know, so it's like people who come in off the street, which is more like what you're interested yeah. in, mm -hmm. you know, versus a whole bunch of bad habits, you know, the ways we don't listen uh -huh. to them, uh -huh. you know, the, you know, the questions we ask, you know, the advice we give, the interpretations and chin up reassurances and all those kind of things, you know, so there's all those bad habits that get in the way. And so how do you help people, you know, like, you know, break overcome some of those habits. So it's like you're seeing people come off the, you know, off the street, they've got all these bad habits. And it sounds yeah. like you're looking at how to address those uh, bad habits to begin yeah. with or, or well, unempathic we, habits, I guess. Basically not. what we do here is we say, don't ask questions, <laughs> you know, like, and we, you know, reflect instead. And that leads to a certain paralysis. Because when you tell mm. people not to do stuff, then they're too busy worrying about what not to do mm. to mm -hmm. help them do what they need to do instead. I mean, the reason is to get people to make a space for empathic responses, right? Mm -hmm. and, and because the you know the questions crowd everything else out. Um, so how do you make a space for it? But but then we get people getting paralyzed by the prohib prohibitions, right? The, pres the proscriptions. Mm -hmm. um, so. Um, Jerry Goodman's solution um, was to frame it as alternatives, as helping alternatives. So he developed a skill training, you know, helping skill training package um, on helping people give them alternatives. So he starts with questions because that's everybody's go-to response. So let's look mm -hmm. at questions, you know. And so he talks about, um, you know, closed questions, open questions. Um, you know, and then all the ways questions get misused to give advice, to interpret, to confront people, disagree with them. So he talks about, and so we start with just by looking at questions and their impact. So that's where people are. And then he goes on and looks at silence and interruption. So, um, and then he looks at, I think it's, um, it's advice giving next. And, you know, I mean, you know, in the person-centered approach, you know, it's like anathema to give advice, right? Yeah. Uh -huh. That's what you do that, right? Instead, Goodman says, um, let me teach you how to give advice, you know? So he says, there's four rules for giving advice. Um, if you want to give advice and be useful, uh, the first thing is you have to understand the facts of the situation, which means you have to listen a bunch, hear the story, right? And then the next thing is you have to understand the person's feelings about it, what it means to them. Oh, it, uh -huh. takes even more. it takes a deeper level of empathy mm -hmm. and then you have to uh -huh. you have to actually know that the person wants the advice and that's another kind of empathy wow well, uh -huh. i mean you know what do you you know that's that that that's that that sort of personal agency empathy i was talking about like what are they there for they really want my advice um because often people you know, and the fourth thing is you have to have something intelligent to say about it and if you follow those four rules, you almost never give advice. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, um, so yeah, what I, you kind of do is you take the, 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 uh, the blocks of the bad habits. You say, sure, you can ask questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead and ask questions. But to ask questions, you first have to hear uh, yeah, what, yeah. You know, what, you know, to ask the right questions. So you're needing to really hear them. And the yeah, same with advice. Yeah, right. yeah OK. Uh -huh. That's a good question. A good, uh -huh. wonder, you know, a good empathic question that opens up. It's like a key to the person's experience. Uh huh. There and comes up. Yeah, yeah. So and then he goes on to reflections. So that's the fourth thing, you know. And so now there's space for for reflections and learning the reflection response. And you know, he he spent a year in Chicago learning just to reflect. You know, I suppose we could say our students here learned spent two years doing that. Um, and then he touches on interpretation and finally self disclosure. 
So this is a set of helping alternatives. Mm -hmm. So the idea is to broaden repertoires and to make a space for empathy in that, um, but help people to be more flexible helpers. You know, everybody, you know, ordinary folks, people in their lives. That's his approach. I actually really like that approach, mm -hmm. um, especially for, um, you know, like the kind of um, community-wide, you know, broader kind of, you know, so... Um, now we what we do is we paralyze them. <laughs> it's not my favorite thing, but I don't run that part of the training. Then they come to the basically master's level training as counselors, and they're like, can't ask a question, I can't, I can't be directive, you know, I've got to reflect. And so they reflect in a kind of superficial level content, um, and they're kind of and so we have to teach them how to take the brakes off their minds, you know, like have to release some of that. And that's basically, you know, I mean, I've, I was with a group today and we're now, you know, seven or eight months into training and they're saying, oh, that's what you mean by, you know, you can kind of basically be more of yourself and draw on your own experience and reflect from, you know, use your own experience to hear what the person's, with other person's experiences that, you know, so they're getting to the point now where they can actually loosen up and they can, they can be empathic at a much more deeper, deeper level because they've gotten past the rules and things, and the prison center police, mm -hmm. they're free, they get freed, they begin to get freed up, and I, that's really essential to get past the prescriptions um, and the rules. So that's, you know, that's the, and then they, they get their, something called a, a, a postgraduate diploma in prison center counseling, which is like part of a master's degree, and then they can, they go on and do EFT training. And then the EFT training, we're saying, okay, we want you actually now to be able to become deeply empathically immersed with your clients so you can mm. hold them in these powerful emotion processes we work with. And so we want to take you further. And that's what I'm going to be over the next six or eight months in Scotland developing this advanced empathy training that's teaching this immersion process, this close empathic tracking. So that's, I mean, and so that what you're saying, what's in concrete terms, what does that curriculum look like? Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, well, first of all, at the, at the sort of this diploma master's level, you know, it's a whole thing, you know, so there's like personal development, you know, large groups, small groups, people confronting their prejudices and biases, um, encountering conflict with each other, um, and really, you know, changing as people, right? Um, and getting a clearer sense of where their blind spots are, where their sensitivities are, what you know, where their raw nerves are and all those things that can get in your way, you know, especially when your clients challenge you. So there's all that. Of course, they're doing skill practice. Of course, they're out seeing emplacements, seeing clients. Of course, they're getting theory. Um, we don't show them enough examples. I think people in empathy training need lots of examples of good practice and different kinds of good practice. Mm -hmm. uh, examples of experience or seeing it? How do you mean examples? Uh, examples of... Yeah, both video examples oh, of, okay. uh -huh. of people who are highly oh, yeah. What mm -hmm. they do is they see each other working in practice. They mm -hmm. practice with each other. So they learn a lot from each other. But um, we did a live demonstration today in, 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 on the course I teach on. Um, so I was the client, and my, my colleague, uh, Lorna, was the therapist. And, you know, so they could see how, you know, a skilled person-centered therapist, she's also an EFT therapist, but how skilled... Uh, person-centered therapist does empathy in a much more flexible, creative manner. Mm, mm -hmm. It's more, much more sort of emotionally present and alive, and it's not mechanical at all. So mm -hmm. that's, and they're amazed, right? You know, so that's the beginning of helping them kind of move to the next phase of their training. Now, at EFT, you know, so we, the curriculum that Gene Watson and I are developing, you know, has a bit of theory in it. You know, so we do some brain theory. You know, we talk about the social neuroscience of empathy, which I'm sure you've mm -hmm. read like into. Like mirror neurons and that kind of. Mirror neurons and, the, uh -huh. you know, sort of Desity and, and Icky's work. Right. Um, uh -huh. Yeah, and, you know, so I, mean, I like, I got this kind of thing I talked to them about, you know, sort of the, the brain systems involved in empathy, which is part of the theory for me. It's like there's, there's a part of empathy, which is just this automatic res emotional resonance which is part of our, you know, it's mediated by the limbic system, 
And it's part of our, if we're, if we're neurotypical, it's part of our inheritance mm -hmm. evolutionarily as human beings because we're herd animals who, who, who give birth to premature young and then have to be highly attuned you know, to each other in the herd and also to our vulnerable young. You know, so, that's, so that's automatic, right? You know, that comes. Um, and we just have to, I think it gets covered up with time you know, in socialization, but it's all like, those blocks you were talking about, yeah. bad habits, maybe. The bad habits, and so we, we can lose touch with that, and so we, part of the training is helping people come back in and really, you know, often intervene in a skill practice and say, so let me just stop you here. What's in your body right now? What are you experiencing in your body, right? And I'll say, well, you know, like, I've got a sense of sadness here. I'll say, so, you know, you're picking up some sadness from the other person, but you're not saying it <laughs> to the client, right? You're not listening to the, your, what your body is resonating with uh, from your client. So it's trying to help people learn to use that again. Um, so that's mm -hmm. one system, that's that automatic mm -hmm. emotional resonance and you know, like infants mm -hmm. have it. Uh, then the next thing is a more effortful process of, of imaginatively projecting yourself into the other person's world. And that's like, you know, you know, neocortical, it's like, you know, um, and um, so that's part of, that's sort of the newer parts of the brain and that's much more deliberate and that you have to learn. And, um, you know, and that's- It that might be kind of more like the role playing, like imagining yeah. being that person, you yeah. kind of just imagine like, okay, if I'm, I've seen that in mediation where you're mm -hmm. given a script of a, of a situation and you say, I'm this person in an office conflict, and you just yeah. check what emotions are coming up within you. And it's amazing how people can just step into that and be so accurate. And mm -hmm. So you imaginatively, so imaginatively project yourself into the other person's mm -hmm. lived world, right? So that's the second system. That's, that's this is a more neocortical. Mm -hmm. And then the third uh, brain process in empathy, and that's involves self-soothing. So that's, I think, um, if I remember, temporal lobe. Um, um, and that's a process in which that helps you to bear another person's pain, your own pain too. But, you know, so when, you're, when your empathic resonance gets going and your limbic system is resonating with another person's pain, then that causes you, that causes me pain too. Mm -hmm. right? So, you know, you're sitting there listening to someone else's pain and then you, it hurts. Right, and the question is, what do you do with that pain? And I think that all the, the questions and the advice giving and all that kind of stuff are ways of the, like warding off the pain mm -hmm. of someone else's coming into someone else's suffering, and um, and trying to shut it off, shut it down, mm -hmm. shut it off, fix mm -hmm. it. You know, so so we actually have to learn how to self soothe, how to moderate and uh, regulate our own distress at knowing another person's pain in order to be able to be in contact with them. So it's, it's regulated enough to stay in contact. And sometimes it's saying to myself, yeah, I know it's hard to stay in contact with that pain, but also you can do it. You know, this is real. This is life. This is, you know, how alive does this feel? To, um, I was, you know, with a client, you know, recently who's like deeply, you know, suffering and such excruciating pain, you know, and um, so how do I help myself stay in contact in order to hold that person's pain um, and, and help, you know, so they can stay with it and listen to the information it's giving them and also feel held emotionally by it um, and work through it, right, you know, so, and that requires I see in your eyes with something going on, or yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, I can, I can really imagine that. And I just, yeah. I'm kind of like really curious, like what are you doing? What do you do to do that self-soothing? So, yeah. how yeah. do you kind of hold that? Or I mean, I think it starts with self-empathy. Actually, mm -hmm. it's like, oh, okay, this is really hard to stay in contact with this. I could, I could be a bit frightened of being overwhelmed by it, or I can feel it touches my old hurts and my raw places. And, but it's, and so, it, I mean, it's self-empathy and then it's like some kind of support. It's like saying, but you can do this. I know it's hard, but you can, I mean, you know, and, 
And isn't it wonderful that we can touch and, and be touched by another person in that kind of way? Isn't that such a wonderful, isn't it such a wonderful part of being alive? It's that kind of thing. Right? Is there also the part of, for me, it, it's a, uh sort of a broader empathy too. It's not kind of being overwhelmed by that one painful feeling, but knowing that I connect with other people as well, and there's different experiences. So it's like a multi-dimensional field of, of experience and uh, that I'm not like totally overwhelmed with that, that one pain. Is that, yeah, that makes sense? Yeah, you're, you're talking about that. That's really interesting, yeah. so. Um, let me think about that. So, I mean, I'm still with the person. Uh-huh. Right. But, but you're absolutely right. There's a kind of sense in which, you know, like, for me, I'm drawing on my previous therapists. Yeah. Um, uh -huh. my, work with, my work with my personal supervisor. Um, I mean, there's something about, about, you know, about drawing on this broader set of resources. So even though I'm not necessarily focally aware in that moment of representing a whole community of understanding and care and people who care you know mm -hmm. i'm not not necessarily paying attention attending to that that cloud of uh the cloud of witnesses the cloud of empathy em empathic people um i'm in some sense representing them too mm -hmm. people have been, been been empathic with me the people have held me in my pain um yeah, so that's so that cool. presence, almost like those presences are still there. Yeah, yeah. feeling the presence of all. Yeah. Uh, so it's actually a broader sort of a global universal empathy that feeling that pain there, and it's like hard, and it, it could kind of get overwhelmed by that pain, but there's kind of like holding others as well, and then also knowing that I can go to sh share that with someone else exactly. too. And that's okay. kind of like, just knowing that, oh, I'll be heard, but I can go be heard about that too. It, it sort of like creates a, like a broader field somehow of, of a more spaciousness to hold that, that, in, that pain. Or, Absolutely, yeah, that's right, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, that's right, yeah, yeah. Those are some of the approaches you use, so. Well, yeah. um, I, I seeing our time here, it's, it's about up. I don't want to keep you too, too long. I really enjoy this conversation. The, I hope we can, uh, you know, keep in contact because I'm looking yeah. to develop this uh, empathy training MOOC, you know, an online training. Uh, we got a group working on that. We have a group doing uh, empathy training literature review, sort of a meta study, uh, yeah. all yeah. the different trainings, uh, articles right. out there, you know, kind of, and then um, also, been talking to some people about starting an empathy trainers association. So, okay, okay. Uh, people who are trainers, you know, in different schools, be it person centered approach or NBC, or uh -huh. um, you know, it could be there's so many different. There's even per, uh, human centered design. I don't know if you're familiar with the design okay. community. Uh -huh. Okay, I've seen uh, some it's on your website, I think. Yeah, that part. So, anyway, that's like another okay. initiative. Yeah. So, yeah. So it's really, really cool stuff, and I would like to keep in touch. I'm also, I mean, I'm quite busy in my life right now, mm -hmm. but also it's just wonderful that you're doing this work. And, um, um, you know, there's way more than I had time to talk about today. So yeah, you know, maybe talk again sometime. Oh, I'd love that. I can, especially you were, you were just starting to get warmed up, getting into the real nuances. <laughs> it's yeah, it's yeah. like I hate to kind of cut it short yeah. because that's really the, you know, you're just really talking about the really the space of empathy and what happens there and how to navigate that. That's really, I mean, deep, uh, deep experience and insight there I think is really helpful. Yeah, yeah. For people. Well, that's been lovely, actually. It's been really fun talking with you, too, Edwin. And um, so good luck with the whole project and things. And um, and keep in touch. Yeah, I'll. Okay. Okay. Wonderful. We'll do it. Look forward to.